So Allie, let's talk about molars. Um, what's different about accessing a molar than any other tooth? Uh, well, you know, as an endodontist, molars are my daily existence, basically. So that's yeah. what we're uh, dealing with here. And they're very different because obviously molars, we know that they're multi-rooted and they have multiple canals. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we come into the game expecting. Whereas the other teeth, you know, most of the time they're a single canal, but sometimes there are second, uh, there's a second canal. When it comes to molars, you're dealing with three canals, definitely for the most part, and then oftentimes four canals, mm -hmm. and especially in the case of the maxillary molar, which is what we're going to talk about, uh, there's a very high incidence of a fourth canal. So this, this is the dreaded MB2 that everybody knows about. So let's just go to the basics here. When we got your maxillary molar, your access preparation, uh, you got your oblique ridge here. Uh, the access preparation, if this is the buckle and this is the lingual, uh, you want to confine the axis preparation to, uh, without really removing too much of the oblique ridge. If, if it's present, to keep it intact. So it's a little bit more on the mesial side. You know, previously it used to be a triangular shaped axis preparation, but that has now evolved to be almost rhomboidal. And the reason why is because of the MB2. You know, previously the textbooks would show you that, you know, these teeth have three canals and then there might be a fourth one uh, called the MB2. But histological studies have now shown that 92% of the time, the MB2 is present histologically. I find it 100% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> you only do root canals on 92% of the time. <laughs> so, uh, but here's the thing. Of the 92%, can you get into all... 100% uh, of those uh, MB2s, no, you can't because they're histologically there, but sometimes they're just clinically inaccessible. And uh, luckily, uh, you know, about half of those cases kind of join the MB1, so you kind of get away uh, with it. But a good percentage of them, about, I would say in my clinical practice, I can get into about 80% 80% of them for the most part. 80% of these teeth um, have a fourth canal that is accessible, and our goal is to find them. So the rhomboidal shape helps us find that dreaded MB2. So you basically have your MB1 here, your distal buckle here, your paddle a little bit uh, bigger here. And while we were told previously that the MB2 is on a line from MB1 to the paddle canal, it's actually not true. And the reason why we're gonna explain in a second is because this area is covered by a dentinal shelf. And when you actually remove this area, you find that the MB2 is a little bit more mesial, actually, uh, than this line. So that's what we're gonna be searching for. And uh, based on the same study that they did here, they found that the orifice was somewhere around, you know, about two millimeters uh, mesial lingual uh, from the MB1. So once you find the MB1, you can go in that direction. And 92% of the time, there was an MB2 there. So, the key with the axis preparations, Dennis, again, it goes back to the idea of a straight line axis. And uh, if you have your, you know, your, um, uh, cram uh, you have your pulpal chamber, this area here, right, uh, a bulge in the middle, uh, right at the level of the CJ is reflected because the CEJ is a kind of a little bit of an imagination, if you will, on the root surface where the crown meets the, mm -hmm. the root. That same thing is represented internally through a bulge. And this bulge is called the dentinal triangle. And if you just remove the roof of the pulp chamber, what you're missing is actually you still have this area that is blocking you, this dentinal triangle. And this triangle has to be removed in order for your file that is at this point kind of standing up uh, at an angle as it's going inside the canal, like in this angle, if your file is going into a canal at an angle, that's not right. What, you, what you're gonna need to do is you need to remove enough coronally and remove this bulge that we call the, uh, the dental triangle, or the dental shelf, which is in, represented right in the uh, middle of the root, uh, right at the CJ level, in order for your file to stand up straight. So this is the direction your file should be going. If you got your mesiobuccal root and you, you put your, canal, your file on there and you leave it and your file is standing at an angle, you need to correct that. You need to be able to put your file in directly 
and go straight. So remember what the concept was, straight line access to the mid root portion of the tooth. So up to here, you want your file to be going straight. This way, it'll have a chance to negotiate any kind of curvature that it may, the tooth may take unexpectedly in the apical half of the root. All right, so a couple things uh, come to my mind. The first is, clearly there's nothing better to find a second mesobuccal canal than an ultrasonic. Yes. And the way that we do that is we work the ultrasonic tip across the dentinal map. There is a dentinal map, and if you follow the path of least resistance by moving from the orifice you have in the direction of the second uh, canal, the instrument will follow that path of least resistance and will ultimately just move you back to the site of that next canal if yeah. it's there. No, you're absolutely right. The idea is to be able to close one eye and be able to see all the canals. It's almost like when you do a crown or a bridge that you have no undercuts. You want to have the same idea in reverse with the endodontic axis that everything is flowing into your uh, orifices and that you can see directly all the canals. So as we look at this, this is a case where, where you cannot close one eye and see all the orifices. In one yeah. case, you can see the uh, palatal canal. The other case, you can only see the facial canals, the buccal canals. Yeah. Here now, is the access created in its right form yeah. and gives you the opportunity when you close one eye to look and see all of the canals. Yeah. And in fact, this cat has a fourth canal. Exactly. So this gives you the best chance to find the fourth canal. Yeah. Goes back to, to what you were talking about in terms of the dental map. It's true that the, um, the furcal dentin is a different quality and different color. The darker color on the furcal dentin than elsewhere. So these are little tips and tricks that would help you find yourself. The strophic calcification has a different quality uh, of uh, interaction with the light than does normal um, primary dentin. So, okay. so let those me, are things that you would let use. Let me also give you one more tip that I think will be helpful both in your maxillary and mandibular molars as well as all the other teeth, is that it is an error to take a round burr directly into this tooth and to try to find the pulp. Yeah. The best thing you possibly can do is create your outline form and then continue to move the outline form towards yeah. the pulp chamber. Yeah. And that allows you, as you can ultimately see here, you pick up the pulp horns yeah. and you get some orientation of what's going on. And as you move apically with your preparation, you also get a sense of the depth. You're absolutely right. When you just take a round burr yep. in and you can't, you know, you don't have a sense of the depth, when you're creating the outline form, you see the dentin, you see the enamel, you know, moving away from you, and you start to have some re sense of how deep you are. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think that's a great uh, tip, and that does help quite a bit with uh, a couple of different things. As you said, getting a sense of depth, at the same time visualizing uh, the full outline as you're going right. down, being able to better see the dental map as you're going down. And lastly, it allows you to nick the pulp horns. Yeah. So the key is to nick the pulp horns so that you can uh, also deliver an adequate interpulpal anesthesia. Now, I always give an interpulpal uh, to every patient. They don't feel it, they're already numb. Yeah. But this gives me a little bit of a, at that point, it gives me the reassurance that they're gonna be numb throughout the rest of the procedure. But the way you can give a successful interpulpal is only if you only nick the pulp. Yeah. If you remove the roof of the pulp chamber, it's too late for interpulpal. It's not gonna work. So you need to just uh, nick it just enough, the width of the, the needle, so that the needle can fit in and create that pressure that's required to do the proper interpulpal. All right, so we've talked about the maxillary uh, um, molars. Let's come back in the next lesson and talk about the mandibular molars. Perfect.